Hi everybody, how are you holding up in these COVID-19 lockdown days? Um, thank you for coming back, joining us on Scuba Diver Live. Um, today, we've got three guests from some of the biggest manufacturers out there, Sunto, Fourth Element and X-Deep. And we are going to be talking about the design process and what goes into dive equipment. All divers love it here. We love it. It's shiny. It's new. It, we want to cradle it. We want to carry it around like a newborn. So we thought, what better, while we can't actually go diving, at least we can find out what goes into actually making it in the first place. But before we get started, I'd just like to do a big shout out to Nikes at 90, who was sponsoring the live stream for us. Um, this is the perfect time now, because we can't go diving, to get your kit sorted out. So if you need any new parts, need anything servicing, sorting out so you're ready to hit the water as soon as we can get out, get in touch with the guys. You can see their details, ticker take in along the bottom. Uh, so touch base with them. Uh, also, if you are liking what you're seeing, just remember to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so you never miss any of our future uprisings. Okay, without any further ado, let's bring in our guests. So we've got Jim Standing from Fourth Element, we've Hello. got Ryan Crawford from Sunto, and we've got Patrick Whitman from XD. Hi right, guys, thanks for coming to uh, see us today. Hi Mark, thanks, thanks for the invite. How are you all uh, surviving in lockdown in the various places around the world that you are? Patrick's yeah, good. the furthest away, right? So, yeah, Patrick, you go well, first. Cause you've got a much more exciting area than where we are. <laughs> um, well, for us, the main thing is we have like absolutely no more tourism. So basically, that has stopped the tourism industry. For the rest, Mexico seemed until lately pretty relaxed about the whole thing. Like people were still gathering in the street. There was the Sunday market. Uh, we were quite easily to move around. Uh, we went exploring a lot. Now, it's like the only thing we can do because the cenotes are closed, but we can still hike in the jungle and, and do our own thing. Uh, but all of our shops are closed, no more tourism. Uh, gasoline prices dropped a lot, so that helps keep it, the exploration pretty cheap for us because we only have to pay gasoline and then hike. Uh, and then we have a, curf a curfew now since yesterday. We have to stay in from 7 p.m. until 5 a.m. And I got almost arrested yesterday morning in my morning run. The police said, if we see you again jogging in Fifth Avenue, uh, we would put you to prison. So I was like, okay, I'm going back home. <laughs> so, but that's about it. So, so far, there's no panic uh, shopping. We have heaps of toilet paper. So all, all of these news have not, have not come through to us. Even in the shopping centers, like they disinfect your hands, they disinfect the... So I was quite impressed. Actually. Ah, the one thing that I really want to say is uh, there was a food truck passing by so when i did my my jogging and i came back there was a food truck passing by and they gave uh boxes of food to people and i was like what do you have to do to get one of those and they said well you need to have a passport and um and you, uh, like a comprobante um, like an electricity bill that you live in this building so i'm like but you don't have to be mexican uh, or we have a residency and they're like no you can have any passport of the world so if you would be a tourist that's stuck here, but that's renting a place, you would have access to that food. So I found that really, really amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, my girlfriend then collected two boxes and she spent all day yesterday, like giving food to people on the street, on the bridge and stuff. So that was, I thought the initiative of Mexico really amazing. Also that they take care, not only on their own, but about other people in the country. So that was pretty cool. No, that is cool. Whereas over here, we've got people driving on their motorcycles, 250 mile round trip for a bag of chips. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Cornwall, I can relate that to you. <laughs> yeah, go on, Jim. Where whereabouts are you in the world? Well, I, well, I'm I'm in Cornwall, and uh, it's definitely not quite as exciting in terms of exploration. Um, but you know, the, yeah, down here it's definitely uh, people taking it fairly easy. But now, you know, when you've got the beaches so close, people are off surfing and um, no diving at the moment, um, following the guidelines. But there's you know, it, it, there are worse places, I'm sure, and I, you know, I feel, you know, really quite lucky to be in in a, in a place where it's not, you know, where we are able to get out and do that. I mean, I feel feel extremely fortunate in comparison with so many people. Yeah, exactly. What about you, Ryan? How is it where you are? Sunny Portsmouth. It's lovely today. Uh, sky is blue, and uh, we're all inside, being uh, keeping ourselves social distancing. Uh, but we are, I, you know, I do live right by the seaside, so that's uh, very handy from uh, just being able to go out and see the blue stuff, even if we can't go on the blue stuff. And it's very blue at the moment. I know. <laughs> it has to be said at the moment that this has to be some of the best weather we have ever had around Easter time and, like, the traditional start 
of the British diving season and we can't get in the water. It's just unbelievable. Whereas if we were allowed out, you can guarantee we'd have gale force winds. Yeah. We've, we've even had uh, uh, seals pulling themselves up on the beach in Portsmouth. So then nobody's ever seen before. I can remember seeing. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty unique times. It is phenomenal. But anyway, let's get back to what we're doing. Because we can't actually go diving, the best thing we can do is talk about dive equipment. Because <laughs> dive equipment's cool and awesome. And at least we can sit there and look at our dive equipment, even if we can't actually use it. So what I thought as a first starting point question, and I'll put it to all of you in turn, is what is your starting point for any new product? And I'll put that to Jim first. Go on the spot. Um, yeah, just put you on the spot, mate. I'll swap it around and put other people on the spot. Don't worry. <laughs> no, I, I guess the, the 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 main starting point for a product is the need. You know, there, there's I mean, there's so much uh, great dive equipment out there that right from the word go when we got started, you know, that all of our conversations initially were about what do we need as divers? What did what did we felt feel like? was missing what did we what what would we like to have and we kind of it's always been a bit of a gamble of like well you know if we think we need it um in our diving maybe there'll be others that, that need it and you know that's that's how we got started and we started from the sort of almost the the uh first principles in that sense and then um we do the research we do the, we, we do come up with the designs we test things and but the but never sort of losing sight of why we're doing it in the first place and i think as we've you know, matured as a company, we've um, taken a lot more uh, feedback and um, information from other divers. Perhaps divers doing more extreme things than we than, than we're used to doing. And certainly, when it comes to the developing the the, the stuff for tech diving, then um, we're getting our information and feedback, and and in many cases, requests from people who are out there doing serious exploration um, in places that we can only really dream of going to. Cool. Okay, sounds good. Um, Ryan, so I suppose, is that a similar sort of uh, thread yeah. for you, really? Yeah, it's the need thing, you know. We uh, run a lot of uh, validation studies with uh, just general diver members, diver members of the public. Uh, it's all good and well as having a great idea and thinking that this is the next big thing. Uh, but until you go and ask divers uh, whether they'd even use it, uh, you know, it, it's not going to be the next big thing, you know. So, uh uh, we're a pretty small team uh, within Sunzo Dive globally, uh, so it's quite easy for us to talk amongst ourselves and convince ourselves what's going to be a brilliant idea. Uh, but uh, until we uh, speak to actual divers, then we, you know, we, we we never know. Yeah, I see. Patrick, you are at the sharp end generally with uh, some of this testing gear and uh, and coming up with some ideas. So, what about for you guys? Uh, I mean, it's exactly what the what the other two guys said. Also, uh, of course, need is always like the the mother of all invention. So, in my relationship with Piotr, it's a lot. Of course, like my diving and exploring uh, that influences a lot. Since I met Piotr from the very beginning, I think in two thousand nine, our relationship was like that. That, of course, already. I mean, besides the stealth, besides the salmon equipment, a lot of the other equipment already existed, but. Our general thought is we don't want just to create another version of the same thing. So usually we take uh, existing pieces of equipment, dissect them, uh, think what are the strong parts of it, what are the weak parts of it. And, and then our relationship is in that far, I really like it because he has an unbelievable knowledge and experience about material and manufacturing. Um, I think one of the things that not a lot of people know is many equipment manufacturers don't actually manufacture they some asian company or somebody they outsource the manufacturing process and then it gets labeling and shipped to them but in case of x -Deep, all of the welding the stitching like everything of the manufacturing is done in-house by him or by his by his crew so he has a lot of experience with that and i through my job and through protec have and through projects with national geographic and bbc have the chance to really travel a lot and experience a lot of different environments uh, in my diving. And usually the environments are sometimes pretty harsh. So as far as testing the equipment goes, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's pretty out there. So for me, it's nice because I can communicate to him like this is missing or this happens all the time and this is breaking and uh, this is uncomfortable. And also from a teaching point of view, because one thing is for me as the explorer to have something comfortable, but then giving it to somebody that has never used 
the equipment or never use the technique and then see what they struggle with also creates a lot of input. And I can get this input, I can give it to him and he sees it from like the designer manufacturer point of view. And like this, we play like ping pong. So I really enjoy, absolutely enjoy working with him because I just have this problem, which I consider to be this unsolvable because I, I, I'm designing stuff all the time in my house. I'm like, yeah, there's like no solution for this. I don't even know what we're going to do. And then Piotr has like this 10 second thought and then it has like this one solution. It's like so easy. <laughs> it doesn't even funny. <laughs> I get you. Well, kind of following on from what Patrick just said, um, I was going to say, do you often look at existing equipment and then look at ways in which you can improve on its performance or its looks and bring in your own elements to it? So Ryan, put that one to you guys first. Uh, no, not really. I think that um, the we've always had a pretty unique uh, look and feel for the Sumter product as it is. Um, we've always tried to um, you know you know follow the mar- follow the market that the market needs best we can. But it's not driven by uh, another product, as it were. We always look at our older products and work out ways that we could try and improve them. But uh, I think everybody's along those lines. But uh, uh, it doesn't really come. It's not really. Pro, it's not really a product-led process. Uh, it's more, uh, uh, you know, as I said before, a need a need-led process. So uh, uh, yeah, no, 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 from us. <laughs> All right, Patrick, back to you. Um. I mean, to a certain degree, I would say yes. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm. I can just talk about myself, about my input. I don't know exactly about Piotr, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm in this now for 20 years, so I've seen equipment evolve, and for sure, I'd influence it. Like in, in when we talk Cybon equipment, uh, one of my mentors in Cybon diving was Steve Bogart. So I was at the very beginning when he started to do designs. And to say that I was not influenced by it would be ludicrous. Of course, there was things that I was like, wow, this is a really slick idea. But, you know, I'm a dry suit diver, so where I'm going to put the weights? And you know what I mean? So for sure, for sure, for sure, there's in outside influences that I get. And I think I'm also really lucky about, about being in Mexico because one of the real things here is you have so many different cultures. Right, like there's British people, there is Spanish and French and Italians and Canadians and Americans, and all of them have worked in Maldives and Egypt and Thailand and States and I don't know where. So everybody looks at the same problem, but from a different point of view, right? With different experience on how to solve this problem. And then our environment here is very shallow, which most people consider deep diving to be difficult when try to hover in 30 meter depth or try to hover in three meter depth, you will see that hovering in three meter depth is more, more difficult. Um, so in very shallow caves uh, with no water movement, uh, which means you're diving in perfectly still water and visibility and everything is decorated and cr- So the, the, ex- the environment is very challenging also. So it has created quite, uh, I don't know, man, I, I think like really high level of technique and procedure and a lot of people inventing equipment. So for sure, Going to the dive sites and looking at other people, I'm like, wow, that's a pretty good idea, and that's a pretty good idea. And then in my, and my not not really consciously, but then in my own head, I'm like, oh, we could use this and do that and move it a bit around. So I would say to a certain degree for sure, but I think one of the things that everybody can, you know, agree to is like X deep equipment in generally is, I mean, we try to innovate every little aspect of anything that we do because that was like one of our key goals from the beginning is. We don't want to just have the same equipment as everybody else with a different logo on it. So we really, really want to innovate, not just innovate to innovate, just to be different, but really look at what are the problems and how can we solve them in like not only a slick way, but also that it looks badass. So we always go with what is like ninja, ninja slash special ops. <laughs> <laughs> look. I like it. Jim, what about you from a fourth element point of view? Well, I think it's I, I think it's it's kind of a blend of both. I mean, we we certainly set out our stall and, and set out to have innovation at the heart of the business right from the word go. I mean, the conversation that kind of started Fourth Element was along the lines of well, Strikey, who's the you know the um, the other co-founder of of, of the company. He, you know, he was the guy who said, "Look, I'm getting cold, and th- surely this isn't right." And 
I'm going to look for solutions and I'm going to do the research and I'm going to find something better. And that, that was the beginning of the, that was the beginning of the company. That was the conversation at the, at, right at the start. And, and it was about finding something that was better than what was out there. But of course, depending on the product uh, and depending on the situation, sometimes people say, oh, well, I just can't get on with this, this piece of equipment. This would be great, something great for you to look at. You know, the, the, our technical shorts, for example, we had to look at what else was on the market before we brought our own to see what, what was out there and what we were going to be compared to. So yeah, you, you'd be crazy not to have an awareness of what's out there when you're designing things. But if you can't bring something new to the table, well, our philosophy is don't bother, you know, don't yeah. bother if you can't bring something new to the table, if you can't Im improve on it. And as a result, I think our biggest challenge is that people look at our stuff and, and, you know, sure, there's a fairly um, well-documented pedigree of, uh, of people emulating, trying to emulate the, thing, the areas where we've, where we've innovated, and they've come up with something similar. Yeah, nice. Well, that actually leads me into the next question I actually have for you, Jim, which was that, so you've said that's the, the route that kind of brought you in, was that Strikey yeah. was cold, because he's mm -hmm. obviously a bit nesh. But when you first, yeah, yeah. Wait till you see him, and you can have that conversation. <laughs> but when you first started, you were really known for your apre dive wear. So, like yeah. your t-shirts and your hoodies and everything were kind of what put you on the, you know, on the map first. But yeah. then, you know, so but you had the the whole idea of like the cold water, extreme exposure stuff was always in the background. Yeah, it, it was, and I mean, it it was a two pronged conversation right at the start, and you know. Strikey had been diving in cold waters, you know, and teaching, teaching um, in the UK in quarries where, let's face it, it ain't exactly comfortable, right? So the um, whereas I'd been traveling around the world and diving wherever I could um, and kind of paying my way to dive around the world by taking um, teaching jobs in, in, the, in the meantime. And uh, so I came back kind of with this sort of real yearning to have an identity like scoot, like like um, surfers had with their surfwear. And I, you know, for me, it was like there wasn't a cool brand out there that made me feel proud to be a diver. For for Strikey, it was much more about the the the, um, the practical and 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 the utilitarian approach to actually being able to enjoy the dive more. And the two conversations came together in in the perfect way. And you know, I'd done my fair share of freezing cold uh, in in the UK in in sometimes in a semi-dry, sometimes in a dry suit that really wasn't a dry suit. Um, and those you know th those conversations came together. And but w when we got going, we knew we wanted to make the best possible technical product to keep divers warm and and that has continued right the way through the development of the wetsuits then into the dry suits and beyond right so it was so it was two-pronged attack because you've obviously just released your uh summer 2020 apre dive wear yeah um, i just saw that we put out a press release for you on that one today so you're still pushing out the clothing and everything so you still like to have that so people can show they're a diver when they're not diving well yeah I mean, when when you really think about it, you know, when you actually analyze your life, you spend way less than 5% of your time underwater. But I mean, you know, just listening to Patrick there, you know, just talking about his exploration and the way he, you know, he goes about his diving, he thinks about it. And when he's thinking about product and, and working with Piotr on things, like we're thinking about it all the time. In fact, you know, the vast majority, probably the audience who are watching this right now, if they're not, well, we know pretty much they're not diving and they haven't been diving for a while. But they're still divers. We're all divers, and we're part of this kind of club, this this secret sect, if you like. We all understand what it's like to be underwater and 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 be, in, you know, in, impassioned by that experience and enlivened by it. And it becomes part of who you are. And if you can wear that the rest of the time and walk around in something, I mean, it, 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 one of those great stories. You're know, walking down the street. I was walking down the street in Falmouth, my hometown, quite a long time ago now, and. Um, walking down the street at somebody walking the other way wearing a fourth element um you know sweatshirt and um yeah i could see the logo on his on his chest and and, and i looked at it and i was wearing something fourth element as well as i've rarely seen without it and uh you know i looked at him and he clocked it and i and, and i clocked his and obviously he was thinking oh there's a diver and i was thinking there's a diver but actually i was going yes somebody's bought one <laughs> um and uh yeah. <laughs> in fact, and the very first time that happened to me in, in London, I was in London on Oxford Street, walking along the walking along Oxford Street, and there was somebody walking the other way in a Fourth Element hoodie, and I was like, I was so excited, I stopped this guy, and I was like, Oh my, you've got Fourth Element? That's 
that's amazing. That's really cool. I, I made that. And he goes, yeah, and just carried on walking. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, at least he was wearing it, though. That's the main thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like it. Ryan, one for you this time. Um, yep. Suntos been making dark computers for years. Um, yep. I know that dark computers are probably one of the smallest you know, items of diving equipment, but they're also undoubtedly one of the most complex. So as a little bit of a potted uh, thing, how did Sunto get started into this? And then how, you know, what sort of like brought you into it with them? It's been a bit of a long story, really. So... Um... So, uh, Sunto started uh, as a company back in 1936, where uh, we started making uh, compasses. Uh, Sunto comes from the Finnish word meaning direction. Um, from the diving point of view, uh, some BZAC divers uh, uh, got hold of Sunto uh, back in 1965 and explained that they'd been diving with a fluid filled compass, which is what we invented, and uh, realized that obviously the fluid couldn't be compressed in the water. And they were looking for you know, the, the, you know, a compass that they could, you know, use, specifically use for diving. And that's where the first ever diving Sunto compass came from, the SK-4. And then that goes through to, you know, we had to involve us in the diving market. Then in 1987, uh, we brought out the SME, which was our uh, first diving computer. And then, you know, and then, you know, on from there to uh, 1987, we uh, then brought out the first diving wristwatch. And, uh, you know, which, which is what people are, you know, um, uh, are, uh, you know what we're known for, uh, you, know, you know, throughout the industry. There you go. Well, that actually brings me on to the next question. Uh, I might as well fire it to you again while we're on to that. And that's what I was going to say was that you basically pioneered the watch style computer. And a little bit yeah. like Jim said, when people have got a Suntor computer on the wrist or another dive com wristwatch dive computer now, it is that like little secret society. You clock them and you think, ah, there's another diver. Now, I know that you're still known for your wristwatch computers. Obviously, the D5 just come out. But then you also just had the Eon series came out with the core and the steel, which were quite yeah. a departure from uh, the wristwatch computers and other stuff you'd done before with the color screens and everything. Um, so I just wonder what was the sort of like driver behind the creation for those two units? So, we, you know, was, our first unit was a big unit. Uh, you know, the SME was a big faced unit. So it's not, it wasn't new to us. And then obviously, I, I imagine quite a few people out there. Uh, at some point, owned a Viper or a Zupa, for example, uh, which are big faced units. But the the Eon range, basically, we've been waiting for that technology to catch up. You know, we have all these amazing ideas, and then sometimes they just can't come to fruition because either you can't get the chips to do what you wanted to do, or the batteries won't last long enough, or whatever. So, you know, we'd had these uh, uh, products, you know, basically on the plan for quite a long time, and then. Uh, once we managed to get the tech to catch up with our ideas, then we we, we brought them to market after what is uh, a, seemed a very long time. <laughs> I was just going to say, I can imagine with some of these, when from when you first seen it at the early design stages and the prototypes, then sometimes for how long it is before you actually see them come to light. Oh yeah, it's years. Yeah, from concept to you know initial planning meetings to. You know, before the mechanical engineers get onto it, and the electronic engineers get onto it, it's 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 not weeks. Oh, we were. I, I have a funny story that um, uh, a few years back, before we brought the Hilo two out, uh, we had uh, the Birmingham dive show where we had a booth at, and uh, a diver came onto the stand and said to me, he said, "Well, I think it's about time you brought a a trimix capable computer out." And I said, "Well, thanks very much for your feedback, and you know, we'll you know we'll feed it back at the line." <laughs> and two weeks. Two weeks later, we launched one at Diva, and uh, we launched the Hilo 2, and uh, he phoned me up and asked for his, uh, uh, where was his cut for the idea, and I explained <laughs> it, it had taken a slightly longer than a fortnight to, to knock up a driver's computer and a new algorithm and everything else that went with it, but he was convinced it was his idea that uh, had, had uh, pushed us into it, so uh, yeah, it, it, is, it is a more drawn out process than most that people are aware of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I can imagine it's a long process. Um, Patrick, one for you. You've touched on it a little bit, um, but X-Deep's got a reputation for having like a very durable build quality and just being exquisitely put together. I mean, I know from testing some of the backplates that are on some of the backplate and wings, you know, I mean, they are so well cut out and shaped and everything that you could hang them on your wall a little bit like some modern art or something. So with them, Again, what's this, with that's the starting point for that. Where I know obviously it's about how they work, 
but also what's the thought process behind just just how to look and everything well like i said before uh when xdeep started they started like i guess most brands in technical dialing to make like back blades and wings but um so we also have still the traditional uh line which is like like a lot of dir guys and stuff that are people that are not really that much into inno innovation and new things but the thought of xdeep is always, like i said before it's always uh look at every part and every piece of equipment and find a way like how could we make that better right and specifically in cases of backplate it was like traveling in airplanes with excess baggage gets worse and worse and worse every year right uh they take down the kilos extra luggage is more and more expensive so what can we do to still have somebody travel with a backplate because we still believe that the backplate even for recreation divers backplate and wing is the ideal solution for for diving because Puts you right away in good trim. People are flat, protect the environment, helps them with the finning techniques, uh, creates a stable platform. And if they would want to move into technical or cave diving eventually, you know they wouldn't have to change equipment at that moment. So then the idea is: so we want them to travel with backplate and and wing style, but of course we understand it's heavier and it's this and it's that. So uh, the main concept was stick with the same rules and principles so we want to have the stable platform we want to have the lift uh we want to have all the things that, that a back blade and wing are known for but we want to have of course our own twist and innovation right uh like jim said before if we feel that we're just producing something what everybody else does and there's no need for it then we're not really into it like even sometimes we designed equipment and at the end of it we were like well it's just kind of good but it's not like, wow, we're really stoked about it. Then, then we don't even bring it out on the market, to be honest. So with the backplate, it was just like cut down on weight. And we always try to have like a visual aspect to it because uh, also like Jim said, and I'm the same because I surf also. So I always thought like being a, a recreational diving instructor in Egypt was like, when you look, when you look at the kite surfers and they, like, everybody's like this dope clothes and all the girls are there and they're like the cool guys from the club. And then come the diver, you know, with his like 80s disco neon color suit. And it's like, yeah, I don't feel cool at all. <laughs> so, or, or a t-shirt that says yeah. dive now, work later, or exactly. send more tourists. Send more tourists. The last ones were delicious with a shark on the front. And it's like, yeah. no, 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 no. Super lame. Super lame. Super corny. <laughs> so if we, can, if we can combine the useful with the cool, then yeah, for sure we're going to do that. Yeah, well, that was part of the reason why we had you three guys on, because... You that brings me to another question that like fits for all of you really is you've all managed to capture the lifestyle side of diving and trying to make diving cool as like you said you see with surfing and skiing and windsurfing and everything um, and your ad campaigns all use really nice eye catching images of people actually using the kit as opposed to it just being a studio shot or anything and I think that that is obviously. You know, we see it being very important because we know how important that is. But from your side of it, how important do you feel that that is to getting the right message out about your product? Jim, so throw that one to you first. It's absolutely critical. Uh, I mean, we don't we don't do this to um, look good. We do this to feel good. And and so our you know ultimately the the what we are what we end up talking about with other divers, what we end up talking about with our buddies and our friends is our experiences and how we felt and what we saw. And, and those are the things that, are, those are the reasons we go diving. So to uh, to create marketing campaign and imagery based on exciting images of, of people basically going out there and enjoying it. And, and that's fundamental because we can all get behind that. And, and I was saying earlier, you know, as a diver and, and as a diver, you want to, talk about and share and express these the, the love of the sport you, you can't do it while you're doing it but you can do it with with the images that you you show your friends you talk you show, show your buddy afterwards and you talk to your buddy about and i think you know it is this kind of fundamental thing that is is part of what what we all feel as a diver that we try to capture in an image or try to capture in um a video or and yeah Engaging people's imagine is, imagination is far more important than um, just telling them the features and benefits of a product. Yep, seems right. Ryan. Yeah, right. it, it seems right on, the, right on the nose there. You know, we want it to be, you know, inspirational. We want people to go out there and 
you know, we know this big world's out there, you know, and we just wanted to go people to look at these things and, you know, just want to be that person, you know, to doing doing that thing. And uh, that's because that, that's, that's what we all want to do at the end of the day. We, we, you know, we do see these amazing images underwater and we do want to be that person. That's what could us into the sport in the first place. Uh, for, you know, for us, we're quite a technical product. So, you know, if we just printed a page out of our manual, then it would just, you know, would mean, it wouldn't mean anything. And, you know, and, you know, so does a, a so there's a, we're only one part your diving is only one side of the company and you know for us the outdoor guys uh have, have suddenly got a bit of an easier run of it because somebody could pick up a running watch and understand what a running watch could do but unless you're already a qualified diver you wouldn't have a clue what a dive computer does for you you know i don't know why i need one you know so these inspirational images that we look for is you know is uh, our way of showing you that you know that this with, with these products, then you, you can go and see these things, you know, and they, uh, uh, they're all out there waiting for you. Yeah. Patrick, what about you guys? Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. M my personal background is I was very strong in, in Austrian alpinism and, and snowboarding as an extreme sport. So the commercials that I enjoyed was like Red Bull and people flying through the air. And it was always like, wow, this looks so, this looks so cool, right? I want to. They, they express a feeling and emotion that you connect with that sport rather than just the sport, right? You, you, when you see the guy flying through the air, you can imagine how you fly through the air. Or when you see cool images like soon to the Hell's Gate in, in Oyomo and stuff, you can imagine to be then experience it. And as Jim said also, like diving advertising was pretty 90s, uh, pretty much until like these new brands came along. Um, I would think of both Element for sure. I would think of Santi. Uh, and, and I would think of, of course, I have, I have personally nothing to do with the ad campaign, but uh, I'm always super stoked because I really enjoy and I really like what XDeep and, and Piotr are doing uh, from the logo, the branding, the imagery. Uh, and of course, what, what um, I can contribute with, with Philip Lehman and, and our exploration group is uh, some stunning videos and, and images that we can show on trade shows and that can be used for, for marketing. But I, I think this is really something that the diving crowd or the fans of diving have deserved for a long time. And I'm, and I'm stoked that many brands kind of like do that now to also uh, capture the lifestyle and, and give people something to be proud. Like I said, with this whole uh, uh, example of the surfers, no, now you can be really stoked to be a diver because uh, it doesn't only feel good. It also looks good. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes that is hard though, isn't it? Because uh, as a sport, we, we're 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 not the uh red bull generation you know you look at these red red bull clips online and it's all fast-paced music fast face action whereas the diving is you know, the ride out the ride out to the right it's the, on the rear of the ribs really cool and fast and then you put your kit together and then everything slows down really slow mm -hmm. uh, and uh you know uh, we're the best one of the world you know you see a surfer on a surfboard flicking his hair back in you know as he comes out of a barrel uh you see a diver taking his mask off which is half full of stock <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not the it's not the same. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, we're, yeah, it's not we, a sexy we, look, we, is it? Yeah. It's not a it's not a sexy look, but uh, um, uh, you know, it's uh, we, we do we do try. <laughs> we have to work harder to make it work. I mean, we don't have we don't have the kind of. I've I've just been watching this uh, halfway through watching this thing on Netflix, the uh, Last Dance with the, the story of Michael Jordan and the Bulls, and and it's fascinating. And then you know, and and the cultural phenomenon that was Michael Jordan. You know, the last time we had that kind of cultural phenomenon was well, Jacques Cousteau, who invented the thing. You know, yeah. so you know, we 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 don't have that, but we but we, and in many ways, I think that's that's why we can celebrate these. This this sort of feeling that we all have. I mean, I, you know, I, I've often said that I believe that inside every diver, there's a James Bond wanting to get out. You know, mm -hmm. but there's that. You know, we we do see ourselves in that, and, and and we we do see ourselves participating in in a sport that is is exciting and and is possibly potentially dangerous, which is maybe why some people find it in, you know incredibly appealing as well. But we don't have, like like Ryan says, we don't have the Red Bull aspects. We don't have the everybody wants to be like Mike. You know, we don't we don't we don't have those sort of things. But we do have these. I mean, no one has the same kind of interactions with big animals that dive. No. no one has. I mean, you know, and cave diving, the stuff that Patrick does. I mean, 
crikey, that that to me that that that's just insane stuff. I mean, that's proper exploration. That's close. That's about as close as you ever get to being an astronaut without getting in a spacecraft. I mean, come on, that that is seriously cool. Yeah, you're right. But like you said, it's that whole Red Bull side of things of people going at speed and this anyway yeah. and diving just doesn't have that. Yeah. Purely, we're, 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 stuff. We're, we've got we've got the adrenaline side of things in other ways like you said inside yeah. the cave some of the you know seams of divers there with a you know a bull shark swimming around them or tiger sharks or something mm. um but it's just it's in a different way and it's also just our sport just doesn't have an audience you know it's not like somebody yeah. dives and other people are watching him diving like the audience are the people that do the sport so i, I guess that's also definitely different but it's also funny when we talk about cave diving from the perception so my dad ended up sitting next to uh, Reinhold Messner, the really famous uh, Austrian or Italian mountaineer who climbed all the 8,000 meter mountains in Himalayas. Uh, and so they get to talk a little bit. And my dad goes like, well, my son explores also, but he explores submerged caves. And then Reinhold Messner was like, wow, that's crazy. So it's, like, it's funny. How <laughs> he's like, no, 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 hang on a second. You climbed every 8,000 meter mountain without oxygen. And that's crazy. <laughs> what I do is like, Feels like I'm gonna fall asleep. It's boring. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just, read a, comment, just read a comment saying it's the only sport where you um, from Alex Griffin he says it's the only uh, only sport where you're actually rewarded for staying very still. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is actually. You're right. Yeah, yeah well, well done. Happened. You're really yeah. not moving. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Jim, <laughs> another one for you. Um, yeah. You've been at the forefront of the fight against ocean plastics, which is obviously a hot topic in yeah. the diving world and the mainstream media now. Um, and then you've got your ocean positive range, which obviously has lots of items now in the lineup, the swimwear and then some apparel wear as well. So what was the starting point for that one? Well, um, it was a phone call uh, from uh, Ros Lund, a friend of mine, who she called me up and said, I've just come back from the Baltic Tech conference in, in Poland saying, um, I found out about these guys who were diving and re recovering uh, fishing nets, and um, you know this this fishing net is being recycled and turn being turned into a yarn. And you know, I immediately basically said that's a an, that's a totally amazing story. Strike and I sat down, and about five minutes later, like, well, it's a no brainer to want to use this product, to want to create something from ocean waste brought out of the ocean by divers you know create something for divers and so um I, we got in touch with the the, the guys who are now called ghost diving but they were uh, ghost fishing at the time uh, run by pascal van erp um and we, we got in touch with them and talked about working with them and we, we sort of got entered a semi-formal sort of relationship supporting them with some equipment but more importantly than that we got to work with um making the first swimwear then rash guards and um and leggings and as we did this it kind of catapulted us into this incredible sort of well a paradigm shift in the in the in the, in the company where we realized that if we're doing this with one product we ought to be doing it with everything and we um, have now made that as as fundamental a part of our business as making stuff to keep you warm is you know we, we we've got to when we consider whether or not we should make a product i mean talking about product development we also consider how we can make it in a better way how we can package it in a better way and um you know and, and that's retro retro innovation if you like for going back and looking at some of our existing products like our thermocline neutrally buoyant wetsuit system we redeveloped using the same recycled nylon which is made from ghost fishing nets and also lots of other uh, post-consumer nylon, particularly carpet. Um, and then looking at un dry suit underwear and, and going forward, we're about to launch a wetsuit that's made from, uh, rather than from petrochemicals, it's being made from plant-based origin. So it's just become this, it's, it's become as important to us as anything else within the business. Well, actually leading on from that one, um... Obviously, like I said, you started the Ocean Positive range, and that was with the Ocean Plastics. But you're also the guiding light behind this Mission 2020 campaign. So, can you tell us a little bit more about that one? Yeah. Well, we we basically we were asked. I think I mean this was I mean Paul uh, Strikey was asked by uh, the 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 UN to make a commitment as to what we were going to change um, in in our business by 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 2020, and, and we decided we would commit to eliminating our 
single-use plastic packaging. And that has been a mission that we set ourselves. And not only that, we then allowed that to evolve into redeveloping our products and developing new products with recycled materials. And we went to the DEMA show and, and, and sort of stood there on, on, on the stand with a backdrop saying Mission 2020, sort of publishing what we wanted to do. And um, not only the, you know, the, the dealers and, and other uh, you know, people in, in the show who are the visitors and the attendees of the show, but also people in the trade came up to us and just said how much this kind of message had resonated with them, how, how great they, they an idea it was. And we thought, well, you know, instead of us trying to hold on to this and, and, and try and make this something unique that we've done, because let's face it, it's, you know, it, it's not rocket science. Why don't we encourage everybody to get involved as well and encourage the dive industry to make a difference to, to say, look, you know, Mission 2020 is not ours, it's everyone's. And we spoke to Ryan and we, and we spoke to pretty much every um, major brand and, and company, plus lots of smaller ones in the dive industry and said, look, we're, we're doing this. Why don't you make a change, make a commitment to change and um, be a part of something that's bigger. And, and if you want to know, you know, if you want to know how to package things without plastic, if you want to know where we're getting our stuff from, we'll tell you and we'll share that information with you in, and in the hope that you'll share information similarly with us. And it's really, really worked. And we, we found ourselves in this community of guys with, um, a community of brands with Mares and 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 Sunto. I mean, Sunto were the, literally the first ones to jump on afterwards and say, "This is brilliant." AP, the you know the, our, our fellow Cornish manufacturers as well, um, joined us as well. And in fact, Sunto and 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 AP kind of sponsored the project and helped us to get it going. And, and but it involves it involves Paddy, involves GUE, Halcyon, Santi, it involves all sorts of you know household names, Scuba Diver magazine. Um, many of the other magazines, even, but also down to individual instructors and businesses, um, you know, to individual instructors who are educating their students and bit dive schools and dive centers that are getting rid of single use plastic. And as a concerted effort, it's had a real effect, uh, which we could never have dreamed of if we'd just been doing our own thing. And it show, goes to show the power of working together. No, exactly. And it's even gone outside of the diving industry now as well, which is fantastic. Um, kind of waving the flag for for what us divers can do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's hugely gratifying. And and but the the best thing about it is the fact that you know Paul and I can sit down with people and have these you know really frank conversations about what we're doing. And and the dive industry gets together, and it, it just it goes to show that we that we are stronger together, and we and we can make a difference. And that that's that's the best thing about the, that process. No. Yeah. Cool. Ryan, welcome back. You disappeared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought you'd maybe run to the pub or something, but you're back, so that's good. I'm in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, the most density city, uh, populated city in the country, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, now you're back. I've got one for you. Um, I've been to the factory in Finland uh, with yeah, your good self, yeah. Um, yeah. and I've seen a little bit of the magic that goes on behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, but for the people that are watching, do you want to give them a little peek about what goes into the creation and the bit that I like the best, the robust testing of each and every computer. Well, you, you're the, you know, we talked about the creation process already from, you know, what goes out from idea to pass to uh, mechanical and software engineers that uh, they bring the physical product together. But yeah, you're right. Uh, there are, um, uh, it's a rigorous testing process we have to go through. We have very, some very strange testing machines. For example, uh, we have, a, 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 there are certain design standards that we have to meet. For example, the product gets uh, placed on a pedestal and hit with a hammer many times. Uh, <laughs> put through uh, what looks like a, a, a see-through cabinet, which tumbles over and over again. So the unit gets tumbled through, through uh, thousands and thousands of processes if it's been dropped and then picked up and dropped again. Um, we have uh, we immerse it in various different liquids um, to see how the you know it just puts up with normal day-to-day -day, uh, uh, things that will come in contact with on the wrist. Um, and and the, one of the more brutal ones is that is we have a weather machine that can uh, uh, weather the product. And this is super important when uh, we look at the longevity of a product. For example, we uh, bought a product a few years back called the uh, D4i. And the body of the, of the watch was the same color as the strap. And we brought many different colors out. Uh, the difficulty was is trying to find because they made it two different materials, the straps are made of silicon and the, 
you know, their, their polymer in the, on, the, on the body of the unit to make sure that they weather at the same rate. So that in three years time that the, you haven't got to strap one color in a body of a computer in another color. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty drawn out process. And believe it or not, one of the hardest colors to work with is, is red. So uh, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we, we try to, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons you don't see that much, that much of a product in red is that the finding the right red is uh, that will weather at the right rate is, is super tough. It is. Well, that, that, I remember the uh, the hammer. That did make me laugh. You had yeah. uh, these guys putting together computers, and it was like being in some um, fancy watch manufacturer because they're there with you know multiple ocular glasses on, tiny little screwdrivers and everything. And then you go around the corner, and there's basically Thor's hammer being dropped onto the face of some unsuspecting computer. <laughs> um, so it was both sides of the coin, really, with that. Very technical and then very brutal. Yeah, and then of course we do all the dive testing as well, you know. So we have we have machines that can physically dive the product, so we can leave stuff go on, twenty four hour runs whilst it pushes uh, robots push the buttons, etc. And then we have uh, uh, all the guys that are involved with the dive side. They uh, have dive Thursdays, where as you mentioned, as you mentioned already, they uh, go to uh, mostly Oyamo uh, mine uh, on a Thursday morning and uh, dive the product to see what the latest version of the software they're working on uh, comes up with, as it were. And then they have a briefing meeting after that, after a th over Thursday lunch, and go on their way and get ready for the next version of the software, the next version of the hardware, to get it ready, you know, get it closer to market. Yeah, that's not a bad local dive site, really. <laughs> yeah, I, I, as, it, as it goes, for, for those of you who've never been, it's a little bit, a similar sort of size to Stony Cove for the UK market, the guys on the call. Um, however, imagine Stony Cove, but at the bottom there's a gateway into a mine system that goes down to hundreds of meters. So uh, uh, the actual, yeah, the, the, the size of the thing is the same. The only thing that I've never had to do at Stony Cove before, though, is uh, smash the surface of the Stony Cove with, with stage cylinders to make a hole to get in the water, which, of course, is uh, what they have to do uh, when they're <coughs> diving, when the surface air, air temperature could be, you know, minus 30. So uh, it's uh uh yeah they're they're a, they're a hardy bunch everybody wants to go diving when we're doing roger ampat but it's the same hardcore guys that go diving on a thursday and i armor through the winter yeah so they probably deserve to go to roger ampat then yeah they they do you're right <laughs> yeah i do recall when we went out that they had to break the ice to get in and we made the the wise decision of staying on the side with a hot chocolate while we watched them go diving <laughs> I, I, I do believe, Mark, on that same trip, though, we did uh, introduce you to the great Finnish tradition of the sa sauna and then broke the hole, just smashed the hole in the sea for you to get in. Yes, and, uh, and unfortunately, we didn't even have a wetsuit to keep us warm then. No, no, it's, uh, it's one more part of the whole uh, Finnish ex experience. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that goes into it. I love it. Um, Patrick, one for you. Um, obviously, as we've said, XD were known for their wings. Uh, mainly to start with, then they branched out, and you've had mass and fins as well, um, and then you've now got a dry suit coming. So, can you tell us anything about the dry suit that's not too top secret? Well, I think what we're most known for is that it always takes us forever to bring everything, anything to the market. But there is really a lot of things that influence that. So, first of all. I, Piotr and I are perfectionists, so until we both think it's until we are both really excited about it, we will not launch. So I don't know how many, for example, from the regulators, I don't know how many 3D printed first stages I have in my office right now. Um, DriveSuit was the same. So uh, we do a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of like communication, and then of course it doesn't help that I live in Mexico and he's in Poland. So then they need. So once we have like online the idea ready. And we're like, wow, this is really unique. This is really uh, something that is innovative uh, and not just you know, innovation to innovation, but that makes actual total sense. Uh, it solves the problem that I have uh, pointed out to him or that I encounter in my teaching and my exploring. Then he sends me the prototypes and then I start, I start testing. And so all of this usually takes, takes quite some time. And as we said, we, we don't want to just produce an, what you already no, for example, in regards to dry suits, you know, I think uh, we didn't want to go with like the DUI type of suit, you know, that is already produced by a lot of a lot of people. We wanted to have something either completely truly original or we don't touch it. 
So we were really lucky to work with a company that uh, is based in Poland that produces dry suits for 20 years. Uh, and then for 20 years, the same workers, which was always really important for us because we want to guarantee ex deep quality, right? So uh, we wanted to make sure that it's not like new guys that come in, but they have the same workers for all the period of time. So these guys know what they're doing because they've been doing it for so much time. Um, so what I generally found in dry suit, what, what was problem for me was usually uh, limited ability of movement and I also didn't really quite like the style that was like too square. And I was like, that doesn't really represent our, our moving environment. And the other thing is, so I've been, I've been using dry suits really since I'm a teenager. So, because I, I learned diving in a dry suit in, in Austria. But so the thing that I found out in my career is you can have material that's either good for puncture wounds. So like in transport, right? When you have the dry suit in your dive bag, uh, in your backpack, when you hike through the jungle, it's good for that because it's good uh, for puncturing but that usually is like stuff like kevlar like everybody jumps on kevlar of course kevlar 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 but in the same time kevlar has a lot of friction right it's rough on the surface so when we go into into cave that's a bit smaller specifically here in mexico because we don't have mechanic erosion where the water kind of makes everything smooth here everything is like velcro we call it velcro rock even like when you touch something it attaches to you so the problem that we faced with surfaces that were not smooth is every time you go into something a little bit smaller, the Velcro rock attaches to you, then you kick and you rip a hole in it. So we had, I realized it's either good for puncture wound or it's, it's good for like the friction, but it's hard to find a material that can do both. So this took us a really long time to find a material that was like really right in that middle spectrum. The next part is the gluing, right? Uh, I think everybody remembers when the whole tape came on the market and everybody used to tape their dry suits and all the tape came off like a wet band-aid after like a month. So I think I had like six dry suits or seven maybe where we just tried different glues because I live in a really humid environment. So humid environment not only means the suit never really gets dry, but that also means there's fungi growth. So we had to like cut the suit and look with microscope and you can see like the, 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 the roots of the fungi growing through the glue. It was really, so that took a long time. So we already had the uh, dry suit on trade shows and people kept on asking, so when is it coming to market? When is it coming to the market? And we're like, uh. <laughs> so we were excited about it, about the idea of the design, but we still kept on always finding problems in, in the testing. So, and as long as we're not hundred percent sure, we're not going to launch nothing to the market, but uh, I'm, pretty certain i'm on the last prototype i've been testing it now for the last month uh well the glue and the tape i've already tested it for a year now so that's fine our new version of a rolled zipper uh also like in one year almost no fraying so there's really some pretty innovative ideas uh it's made by a guy that makes suits for military and police and people that have to crawl into ribs at full speed and whatnot so even like doing uh, dry caving and climbing with it is pretty nice and um pretty sure it's gonna hit well of course we were slowed down by uh, first, we changed uh, also our shipping from no plastic to, to paper since quite some time. So that took a lot of effort and, and focus. Not my, quite that much effort because it's all in-house, so, but that took some time. And then, of course, the, the Brexit thing with the regulators and then COVID. And like it, at the moment, it like, seems like there's a lot of stuff going on that makes it a bit difficult to bring equipment to the market. Uh, but, uh, but we're very, very confident that uh, the suits is, is, is done and we're going to launch them soon. I, in fact, uh, yesterday ordered like six for my, for my team. And uh, also with the regulators, we use an Italian uh, company, which you know, Italy had, didn't have a really great time lately with, with COVID. So they were slowed down, but they are back uh, working now also. So we're pretty confident that uh, everything hopefully is the COVID thing kind of like slows down or completely in Europe. We're very confident that everything is going to be up and, and ready for the market in a very short time. Good. That's good. And actually, you mentioned it then, and that was the next thing I was going to come into, was one of the most long-awaited developments is the regulator. Because I remember seeing a prototype of this several years ago at a show, and, uh, and it didn't look very different. But then it was like, it just vanished. And then it came back and then it vanished again. So it was really, it was just a little bit about where are you at with a reg now and what makes it so different from anything else that's out there that you're allowed to tell us about. I'm allowed to tell you everything, isn't it? <laughs> but, 
So the original idea was very simple. I was complaining to Piotr that when I'm at the end of the world, you know, traveling after five flights in South Madagascar, I have to bring so many first stages because some days we're with the rebreather, some days we are uh, side mounting, and then some days I, I need them for stage, right? And like, you can use this, it's good for back mount, but it's not really good for side mount because this is the turret, but and for stage, but then you can't really flip it up. And, this turret is good, but it misses support for. So it was always something that was annoying about it. And what I wanted to do, I just wanted to have a bag with 10 first stages in there and then arrive in the project. And for whatever I would need it, I could just take a first stage out and it would work. So that was the original thought. So because everything starts with the need, right? So that was our need. Let's create an incredible versatile first stage that can do all different types of diving. Uh, with different tanks also, right? Because we have aluminum, but then we've also steel. And the neck on steel is shorter, so the hoses hit the neck of the tank earlier. Uh, then you have Worthington, Faber. So there was a lot, a lot, a lot of different testing to get just the angles right. And then when we came up with the front-mounted turret, which is, I believe, to be truly innovative, uh, we even realized, I guess there might be even more things to do with this than we even comprehend right now. So I'm stoked just to launch it to see what other people now, configuration-wise, come up with how to use that first stage in different ways. Because it is it definitely, when you look around, nobody has a, a front-mounted turret the way we do. Uh, it's also patent pending and stuff. So uh, I think that's uh, a really cool, innovative thing. And then, yes, so me personally, I dive them, I reckon, at least since two years. Uh, and then there was always some small stuff that we were just not happy with. Uh, first with the first stage, then with the second stage, then with the hoses. And as I told you, like, I know we take a long time to bring out equipment, but when it comes out, you're going to see it's going to be, it's going to be dope. And as mentioned, uh, we went, the only thing that slowed us down lately was, was, uh, the COVID in Italy, but those guys have been running and it's in full scale production right now. So, uh, that is going to be out very, very soon. Cool. Cool. Right. So that actually led me on to another question, um, which was without giving away any secrets, what does the future hold for each of your brands? So, Jim, over to you first. Well, um, <clears throat> when we we launched a new undergarment at uh, at Dima, and you know, sadly, we were. It, it's also been a little uh, bit of a victim of the of the COVID situation in terms of it's been delayed. It was supposed to be out now, and uh, we went back to to our roots, if you like, and 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 continued a project that we've been working on for 15 years um and uh in in developing a new a new undergarment which we believe the goal the ultimate goal was to have greater thermal protection for less bulk um and we achieved it um in, with with this new the halo ar which re, which will eventually replace the halo 3d um that's coming uh it's just a little bit delayed it'll be uh, here later this year now um, and that's a hugely exciting development for us, and that you know that's that's through it's going through, it's been through various testing, sort of internally and externally, um, with with great results. We're really excited about that. It's going to be it's certainly by far the the highest performing undergarment we've ever produced. And given that we're known for producing pretty good stuff, to keeping you warm, we're, we've got high hopes for that too. And of course, continuing our developments of our of our. Um, Ocean positive collections, the uh, the wetsuit I mentioned earlier, which we hope will um, show the way forward that in, in the direction of travel for wetsuit development in the future, using more natural source uh, products rather than using petrochemical or limestone dug out of the ground. Um, in the early early stages of testing it now, but so far I'm rather um, from a diving perspective. But the suit will be um, now coming out in uh, July or August, not exactly sure when, but it's, um, uh, you know, the, the, we've now had the luxury of a bit of a delay on its launch of even more testing. So it's been out there being used now for um, just under a year as a wetsuit and, and holding up very well. So that's that's an exciting thing. And of course, develop continuing the developments of our dry suit, um, the Argonaut, which really for us, one of the major developments that we brought to the market, the innovations we brought was the ability to measure a dry suit without uh, anybody needed to touch you and in the current situation with covid and, and coronavirus that we that is something that we think will need to be a technology that people get their get their heads behind in the future of how do you how do you measure someone for a dry suit without touching them 
uh, you know, we, we we solved that a few years ago and and have been refining it over 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 the last few years. And it's something we're still working on and still developing a way of ensuring that we can essentially, you know, have somebody can get a really great fit for a dry suit from their front room uh, or, or you know or their apartment and that's something that we're, we're continuing to work on there too cool ryan anything that you can uh, shed any light on or is it all top secret and you'll be shot if you say anything most mostly but uh we're, we're, we, but as, as we're, we're we're slightly ahead of jim on the uh sizing thing because you can put any of our products on around your wrist and if it's a little bit <laughs> big just just do the buckle thing <laughs> Don't, don't, don't touch anybody. It's, uh, so we're, we're, there. we're there already, Tim. So, uh, oh, <laughs> so um, we have, you know, we just brought out, uh, we just did a new situation for us where not only we're we bringing out new product, we're bringing out new software for products as well. So, you know, the, the commuters of the past where the software was locked in that time of manufacture, and, you know, now we've, we've just, you know, only, only a couple of weeks ago, we've just launched a new software uh, version for our D5. Uh, which brings new features for that uh, that the watch hasn't had before so uh you know it makes it a bit more of a wearable everyday watch because people are used to smart watch functions and now you can receive text messages and whatever to your notifications to your wrist right and that's uh uh just a download from you know from when you connect it up to the unit so that's a product we, we, in itself even though it's not a physical thing that uh that's new we have got people working on newer versions of the same product that we've already got out uh and then you know, as I said before, we have ideas that we're limited on technology on, and we have your know, future technologies people working on that. Uh, but we're just waiting for tech to catch up. Um, and uh, once it does, we'll be with you with something loud and proud, as it were. Cool. Right, I've got one more just to round out from me, and this is an interesting one. You don't have to name any brands, but we just thought of the theory: is best diving story where you've been on a dive and then there's been an issue with a piece of equipment. So just so you that, we don't have to name any equipment, but just any best story where you've had an issue with, that was equipment related. I'll let Patrick go first because I bet you he's got a great one. <laughs> I have a, such a long list. I don't even know. <laughs> How long have you got? Uh, I think the funniest was, and I can definitely not name the manufacturer. I'm, I'm sorry. But so the funniest was, so when we did the big expedition in, in Madagascar, so we were a really big team. There was a lot of scientists. We had like 32 scientists. We had uh, uh, paleo climate guys from Okinawa, from Oxford University. The Okinawa guy was funny because he spoke. Yeah. Oh no, we've lost, we've lost Patrick's sound. Oh no. <laughs> Well, while we're waiting for Patrick to come back, Jim, I'll let you start to take over. Well, I, I think um, probably it's more user error than uh, than 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 the equipment. Um, but no, it, it, in fact, the, I think one of the most amusing things from for me was uh, I'd, I'd been on an expedition uh, looking for a wreck in uh, Labrador in in Canada, and freezing cold, and I'd come back and and. Uh, it was telling this story to um, telling this story to this um, a club in Norway, and obviously incredible cold water divers. And uh, you know, and I, I started talking about the dive times in minus two degrees, and 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 how long we were in there, and and finished this incredible, you know, what I thought actually, you know, incredible story of going looking for a world, going looking for a World War Two um, wrecked plane, and finding it in these in these freezing temperatures. And only for them to say, so you know, what kind of diving are you doing these days? And um, and 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 I then proceeded to tell tell them the story that I was attempting to kind of recreate my friends' surfing experiences, who all go for a surf before work, and you know they've only got like forty five minutes before work or whatever. And uh, so I then proceeded to describe this, uh, you know, setup with a modified back plate, a single uh, three liter pony with. Uh, you know, a single regulator and just a contents gauge on the back, no BCD. And I basically go off doing a bit of snorkeling and free diving. And if I see something interesting, throw a reg in my mouth and stay down for a while. And I suddenly realized that I was in a, a I was in a crowded room of exclusively GUE style divers. <laughs> and and the, and I immediately knew that I'd lost my audience. And anything I'd said beforehand was that they were just leaving me like, you really do not know what you're doing, do you? And, and, and you know, and it was just the stony face, sort of 
very classic sort of Scandinavian look like you're out in the cold now and you're staying out in the cold and you, you don't know how to use anything, do you? It was it was it was it was a terrible experience that um, I, I I have to say I've carried on doing it though. <laughs> Patrick, you're back. We'll come back to you now that we can yeah. hear you again. Yes. So so basically, back to Madagascar. So in any way, shape, or form, we come out to this one cave uh, called Andakatomibola, and it's in the middle of nowhere. You have to remember that all of the diving equipment that we have there, we brought with containers. M massive shout out to National Geographic for helping us with it, but. So anyways, we're hiking out this really long distance and suddenly there are people there. So this is really not common because we're in the middle of nowhere. So we meet the first two people and it's like, oh, that's a bit weird, locals. And we go further and, and suddenly we realize that big parts of the forest were chopped off. And we're like, wow, they're really destroying nature here. Like, what's up? And there's more and more people. So we're like, excuse me, what are you doing here? And then there's these two guys that come over that were engineers from the capital. So they speak fluent French. So they come over and they're like, Hey, uh, and I asked him, hey, what are you guys doing here? And he goes, like, no, 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 what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, we had a dive team that explored this cave. And he goes, like, well, we are diving here too. And I thought, uh, okay, that is strange. So who is diving? And it's like, well, it's two locals. And I'm like, but local cave divers? Like, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, we're looking for mercury. And I'm like, you look for mercury in the cave? And he goes, like, yeah, yeah. So they have like solar panels outside the dry cave, long cables running down into the dry cave to the water with lights. There's like 30 people down and it's quite like, it's like 100, 150 meters down to the water. And there's these two local, I don't know, mid 20 dive masters from, from Fort Dauphin with like ripped wetsuits, uh, a single tank on their back and they don't have underwater torches. So the government there gives out free condoms for the people to keep population down. So they just got like some Chinese made flashlight and they put it in the condom and they make a knot in the back. And so like they're underwater looking for mercury. <laughs> so we do, <laughs> so we do, we do a dive and it's pretty deep. So we're doing decompression. So one of them comes down, like grabs me on the neck and it's like, yeah, yeah, you guys are cool with this like condom flashlight. And I'm like, yeah, dude, I can't come to the surface. So anyways, and we come up, and so later they told us that they had watched a video where they saw mercury in the roof, in the ceiling of the caves. No, no, no. And then I realized they must have watched some YouTube video where you can see like the reflection of the light and the bubbles. Yeah. Because the mercury wouldn't really float, would it? But so, <laughs> long, but so I kid you not. So they had chopped off the entire forest to have a helicopter landing pad to take the mercury out. So now we come to the surface and everybody's like really close, right? Because Madagascar has this history of Europeans robbing the country, right? They have really strict laws about paleontology. We need like crazy amounts of permits to move any bones out so that paleontologists can study it and whatnot. So all of them are like kind of like glued to us, like watch everything that I take out of my pockets and stuff like that. And we have a survey device, which is called MNEMO. So we use it to, to measure the line and to make a map of the cave. So I take the Nemo out and Ryan, my dive buddy says like, hey Patrick, why don't you give me the mercury <laughs> detecting device? And our translator was like, whoa, 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 slow down, this is not funny. Like these guys can literally put you in prison or even kill you on the spot if they think that you're stealing the mercury from them. So definitely sometimes you run into quite interesting uh, things in, in, in Madagascar, so. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, no mercury, no mercury has been found today. <laughs> today. <laughs> but uh, but they keep on they keep on searching. So that's that's definitely quite interesting. <laughs> I can imagine. Ryan, over to you. So mine was uh, uh, it's a, a simpler story, but it was involving a, a friend of mine who, uh, let's say, always looked for the best possible deal when buying dive kit and didn't put actually any value in spending decent money in gauges. And uh, he bought a, a reg, new reg set and it had come with uh, gauges. And uh, we been diving and uh, uh, he uh, was swimming along and then with, you could see him looking at his gauges and he was looking a bit concerned. And after a while, we, you know, he surfaced and he, he was indicating he wanted to surface. And on the surface, he'd, he showed me his gauge and uh, 
the gauge itself would have, you know, looked like a normal, normal smaller gauge. But if you tapped it, the cards behind, which told you where the printed thing moved. <laughs> so uh, he had, he could, he could by tapping his gauge the right way, he could change his gas level for anything from 70 bar to zero just by um, just by tapping on the side of the gauge. So uh, <laughs> uh, as far as kit, kit fails, that's that's the the, the most spectacular. And normally, it's di diver fails using the kit, but this was definitely a uh, yeah. Just should have spent a bit more money on his gauges. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's probably one of the most important ones. It's always handy to actually know how much air you've really got. Mm. Yeah, rather than trusting a guesstimate. Guesstimate is never a good a good start. <laughs> yeah, it is. I can imagine. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much, guys, for coming. Um, it's run on a little bit. We haven't actually got time for any viewer questions, I'm afraid, because we've just been waffling on and having a good chat. Um, so, Jim, Patrick, Ryan, thank you very much for joining, and uh, right. we'll talk to you soon. All right. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Right. So there we go. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, remember, subscribe, hit that bell so you don't miss anything in the future. Um, Final shout out to Nact at 90. Remember, their online store is open. So if you need anything while we're all in lockdown, look them up. Um, and they can also do some servicing and stuff for you as well. Um, basically, it's just for me to say thank you very much for joining us. Hope you've enjoyed yourself. Uh, we'll be back again at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, the 12th of May, when we're going to be joined by adventurer Andy Talbot, who's a regular in the pages of Scuba Diver, and Chris Jewell. Uh, who's obviously best known for being involved in the Thai cave rescue. Well, the two of them have joined together with uh, underwater photographer Richie Stevenson, and they've been exploring some caves in southern France. So we'll be having a chat with them about that. So I look forward to seeing you then. Otherwise, stay safe.